when I first um, came to Birmingham and worked with Rodney Sneeks, who was my predecessor. And, and, and he was really the person who got me inspired into treating bone tumours. Um, because I qualified as a doctor in 1976, and I worked in London uh, with a chap called Rodney Sweetham. And in those days, all we could do was, was amputations. And um, I thought, uh, and I saw so many young people having amputations, that I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I didn't want to ever see another bone tumour again in my life. And I came to Birmingham, and I was told to go and work with Rodney Sneath. And I said, well, I've done bone tumours, I don't want to do them again. They said, no, no, you're the most junior one on the team. You've got to go and work with him because no one else wants to work there. And so I thought, oh goodness, another six months of, of bone tumours, this isn't what I want to do at all. And the first patient I went to um, was having something called lymph salvage. And I'd never heard of this. Uh, and she had a tumour osteosarcoma in her arm. And um, I couldn't believe that a surgeon was going to cut out this tumour and replace it with a metal prosthesis. And it was successful, um, and I, I, I was hooked. And that, of course, is why I'm still dealing with bone tumors today, very, very many years later. So what I'm going to do today is quickly tell you about some things that we've been doing um, over the last few years. And one of the things that really, really interests me is earlier diagnosis. And so many people I see come to me with a long, long history of, of going to see doctors and doctors and physiotherapists before they get the diagnosis made. And Years ago, in 1986, I set up a database in Birmingham that collects all the data of the patients that we see. And two of the very simple things that we collect are the size of the tumour at the time it's diagnosed, pretty simple thing to collect, and also a really simple measure of how long have you had symptoms. So every patient I see, I say, when did you first start having symptoms? And they say, oh, well, it's probably about six months ago. And what were those symptoms? So this is what we've been doing, and I kept this data for 25 years. And we've been doing it for both bone sarcomas, which are of interest to you, and soft tissue sarcomas. And you can see the numbers there, 2,568 patients with bone sarcomas. 1,240 osteosarcomas, that's a huge number. Um, chondrosarcomas arise in <coughs> older patients, Ewing sarcoma, we've heard about already. The average um, bone sarcoma is 10.7 centimetres, that's four inches in size. And it hasn't dramatically changed over the course of that time. And you can see not a lot of difference between the different types of tumour there. And this is an age distribution down the bottom, showing, not surprisingly, the most common age is teenagers. 16 is the most common age that we see for, um, for all of our bone sarcomas. And what we've then done is to look and see if we've got better over the course of time. And this is a graph from 1985, I think, down the bottom there, when we first started collecting data, just one or two patients then, up to 2009, when we did the analysis. And the graph in blue, uh, red is the median size, the average size of bone sarcomas diagnosed over that time. And you will see that for bone sarcomas, it has gone up and down a bit, but statistically, it has not got better at all. And that is a really, really sad thing. And what we did find was that women actually are more conscious of their, their tumours. They present with their tumours half a centimetre smaller than men. So well done, girls. You're more, you get to doctors quicker, you get diagnosed quicker. And that's just significant. <coughs> Soft tissue sarcomas, which are the ones in blue, have got half a centimetre better over 25 years. It used to be 10.2 centimetres, it's now 9.7. So people with soft tissue lumps and bumps are still presenting when they're about that big, about the size, or well, bigger than an orange, about the size of a small grapefruit. This is the median duration of symptoms. There are some people who will tell you they've had a lump there for 30 years, and then suddenly it turns bad and it turns malignant. This is a graph again in blue, uh, sorry, in red this time, of bone sarcomas, median time to presentation. And what it actually shows is that it's gone up. And so people are getting longer from when they first think something is wrong until when they get to uh, a diagnosis. And it's gone up um, from 16 weeks average before 2000 to 20 weeks now. So that's not very happy, is it? 
Something is wrong in the state of the nation. And if you look at the different diagnoses, these are the average duration of symptoms. So most people with an osteosarcoma will have had something wrong for three months before they get the diagnosis made. Chondrosarcomas, which are a slow-growing tumour, it's a year. If it's a tumour of the pelvis, it's two years on average. So people have a long duration of symptoms. So why, why are things missed? Well, a lot of things are missed because people have such a low level of awareness. This is a chap, he's a university lecturer, very, very bright cookie, and he's got pain in his shoulder, he's 35, a bit older than a lot of the people that we've been talking about here. But he had pain in his shoulder for six months, and he went to the doctor and had an x-ray um, done, and this was reported as just showing a little bit of thinning of the bone. And what actually <coughs> showed that, that bone has been eaten away. And he went to an orthopedic surgeon, who shall remain nameless, who said, oh, painful shoulder, I'll do an operation, I'll have a look inside your shoulder, what's called an arthroscopy. And the arthroscopy was completely normal. He said, I don't know what's wrong with you, go and have some physiotherapy. And the physiotherapist said, I don't know what's wrong with you, you're getting worse rather than better. And this was his x-ray six weeks later. And it doesn't seem a rocket scientist to tell you that the whole of that bone has now been eaten away. And it was blatantly <coughs> obviously there on the first x-ray. One in four of our patients has had an x-ray which has been missed by someone. And that's a pretty sad state of affairs, that early signs of bone tumors are not picked up early enough. So there's a low level of awareness by x-ray doctors, by orthopedic surgeons, by GPs, by everyone. And the thing is, we're not getting better. And this is despite all sorts of guidance that has been put out there. As long ago as 2000, um, I wrote some guidance that was uh, published by NICE about early diagnosis of bone sarcomas. Um, and it just doesn't seem to be getting, uh, making things better. So we need something new. The question is, what? Well, I've got a medical student working with me at the moment called Andrew George, and he's been doing a uh, BSc, which he told me yesterday he's, he's fortunately passed. Um, and what he's been doing is look interviewing all the patients that we've seen over the past six months and getting a history from them of what their symptoms are. But not just when they come to us. He's going back and saying, what was the very first thing that made you go to a doctor? Because that's one of the key things. If we can work out why people went to the doctor originally and they were reassured, told it was growing pains or something else, maybe we can find an amalgamation of symptoms that actually indicate, hang on, this should set an alarm bell ringing. This is what GPs should say, hang on, could this be a bone tumour? And refer the patients earlier. And he's really repeating some work that some of you will remember was presented here, I think at the very first BCRT meeting, um, by two other medical students I had working with me, Graham Johnson and Janice Smith. And they showed this graph down the bottom, that there was an average of 1.3 weeks before a patient went to see their GP, which is great. <coughs> there was then a delay of two and a bit weeks until they were referred somewhere else, another two weeks until they were got to see a consultant. And then look at that, seven weeks delay between seeing a consultant and the actual diagnosis being made. So things, we, I, I'd like to think, have got better, but on the evidence we have, they probably haven't. One of the problems with Andrew George's pro project is that he was not given ethical permission to speak to children. Now that meant that anyone age, under the age of 16, he couldn't talk to. And this was due to, due to the timing of the, the, uh, his application to the Ethics Committee. So we couldn't get a lot of osteosarcomas and children with hearing sarcomas. And the, the people he saw were predominantly older people who had chondrosarcomas. And what he found was that the patient delay averaged six weeks. So that was the time before the patient went to see a doctor with their symptoms. And I suspect this is largely because we had a lot of older patients who sort of said, oh, it's just old age, it's, it's you know, I'll put it down. But then the doctor delay was 17 weeks. And that's the time between first seeing a doctor and the diagnosis being made. So things are not that, that good. And what he's done here, he's looked at the symptoms that they had at the first presentation to a healthcare professional, the GP usually, 
and at the time that they actually arrived with us and had the diagnosis made. And you can see bone pain is the most common thing. It's a, a deep pain, deep inside, very difficult to describe. It's a bit like a toothache pain that's somewhere in, deep inside you. And the one which always I worry about is night pain. If someone's got pain that's waking them at night, that is not right. And that should bring alarm bells with anyone. So what we're now doing is trying to put this together into um, uh, looking at soft tissue sarcomas and we're going to try and extend this uh, to children now and, and look at the symptoms that they have at the time of first presentation so we can maybe uh, issue better guidance. What happened when people when first went to their doctor? A lot were reassured. A lot of them were investigated. Very few of them were investigated appropriately. A lot were sent for physiotherapy, which of course did nothing. Um, a lot were referred to a local hospital for investigation, and that's when the delays occur, because local hospitals aren't thinking, well, someone with a pain in their knee could have a bone tumor. They're thinking, oh, it could be a torn cartilage. And the trouble is, a lot of the time, it will be a torn cartilage. So improving and working out what the right symptoms to be worried about is pretty important. Okay, so we haven't got the answers yet, but we're, we're, looking, at, uh, we're looking at working towards it, and I know that, that is a passion of the BCRT um, trustees to try and work out how we could get these tumors diagnosed earlier. Okay, a very quick couple of slides in the middle here. I'm, uh, with, there's something called the National Cancer uh, Intelligence Network. This has been set up by the government uh, and to provide data about cancer. Up until a few, three or four years ago, there was a, a moderate amount of data about cancer, but it was stored in individual cancer registries. Now it's collected nationally. I happen to be the chair of the Sarcoma Group of the National Cancer Intelligence Network, and it's based in Birmingham, fortunately. And if you look at the national, if you look into your, to Google, National Cancer Intelligence Network, and go to sarcomas, you will find that they are producing some fact sheets, um, probably two or three a year now, that give information about sarcomas. This is what's called the age-specific instance. And you'll see in uh, green, the curve for incidence of osteosarcoma, and the peak incidence is in childhood. But as you get older, there's another peak, and that's related to uh, osteosarcoma sometimes arising secondary to other conditions such as Paget's disease. Um, chondrosarcoma goes up as you get older, and Ewing's disease is principally a disease of uh, children and adolescents, but very few arising uh, as you get older. What we've also done is look at the um, the incidence rates to see if it's getting more common. And this goes back over ooh, 25 years, I think. And you can see the graph for men and for women. And basically, it fluctuates a bit year by year, but it stays static. We believe there are about 150 osteosarcomas a year in the country, and about 80 Ewing sarcomas, and about 120 chondrosarcomas. And that number, yes, it may go up or down by 10, 15 a year, but that's really more or less what we're seeing. And you can see they're slightly more com uh, common in males than in females. Are we getting better at curing them? Well, this is a, a enjoyable hope so, wouldn't you? Well, I've been involved in treating osteosarcoma, as I said, for 35 years. And the biggest difference that has been made is chemotherapy. And that came in in the early 1980s. And the trouble is, we're effectively using the same chemotherapy now that we were almost 30 years ago. And there's very little improvement that has happened. And that's why the survival curve, which has reached just over 50%, has been flat for so many years. And there are new drugs on the horizon, and hopefully they're going to make um, a big difference. Another thing that's come up here is, are people all getting treated at specialist centers? This again is a graph looking at whether people have been had their operation at a specialist centre. It's slightly confusing, but what it shows is that 80% of young people up to about 25, 30 are being treated in a specialist centre. And there are now five specialist centres in England, one in Newcastle, one in Oxford Street, Birmingham, London, and Oxford. But 20% of people are still not being <coughs> treated at a specialist centre. And we're looking into the reasons why those people aren't getting the surgery at the specialist centre. Some of them, of course, don't need surgery or they're not suitable. Um, but we're looking, uh, we're looking into this to try and clarify this a bit. 
Okay, I've got just over five minutes left. And I just want to tell you about the National uh, Ewing's MDT. Ewing's sarcoma is a, a difficult tumor to treat. There's 80 a year in the country. And the treatment of it is a combination of chemotherapy and surgery and sometimes radiotherapy. And this is a, a typical, rather uh, nasty looking Ewing's sarcoma in a young child. Uh, that's a femur, the 5 0. The white bit is a Ewing's sarcoma. And you can see it's going almost from the top of the bone, almost down as far as the knee joint. And that was the scan at the time of the presentation. And you can see how massive it is. It's grown out of the bone and just expanded. And what will happen with, with chemotherapy, that will shrink back in again. <coughs> that child is still going to need an operation. And probably it's going to need an operation to take out the entire leg bone, the femur, and replace it. So pretty big stuff. But there is no international consensus for any one individual what the right treatment is. And this all became apparent um, some years ago when we did a trial of chemotherapy. And this trial was being run in England and in Germany and a few other countries. And Ian Lewis in the audience here was very much a key role in this trial. And one of the outcomes of this trial was that we just as a matter of interest, did a graph comparing outcomes between Germany and England. It wasn't part of the study. We didn't think the Germans would be better than us. We had no reason to think that. But they were. And this was a, what's called a survival curve. And the Germans uh, are in green, and the English are in red. And what it means is that after 10 years along here, the Germans have cured almost 70% of the people with Ewing sarcoma. And us in England have only cured 60%. And it's a 10% difference. And we thought, what is wrong? Is it that the people in this country present later so they've got bigger tumours? Is it because we're doing something wrong here? Is it because the Germans are better at giving chemotherapy? What is it? And basically, it looked as though one of the problems in this country was that we were not getting what we call local control as well as they were in Germany. And it looked as though they were being far more aggressive at cutting the tumours out than we were in the UK. And we were giving much less aggressive operations and relying more on radiotherapy. Now, radiotherapy can be very good for humans, but we know that although it may kill the tumour off, there's actually a greater chance it will come back again than if you cut the tumour out. So all this um, led to an international consensus conference that was held four years ago, and it was funded by BCRT. Thank you very much indeed. And it was held at another lovely hotel. And you do choose lovely hotels, and it was a lovely sunny day. Um, and we had about 100 old people from all over the world come to share their experience of viewing sarcoma, and to try and work out whether we could improve it and get international agreement. And um, one of the consensus findings of this thing was that a national multidisciplinary team meeting was needed in the UK. This just gives you an idea. This compares what happens in England with Germany. And this is looking at, in Germany, they use an awful lot of radiotherapy and surgery. If you see surgery alone, <coughs> in Germany, only 15% of patients. In England, 35%. Radiotherapy alone, in England, 40%. So the Germans were using much, much more the two together than we were in England. And we think this might explain the difference in outcomes. So we also, at this conference, we asked people to, we gave, we gave them some cases and said, how would you treat this? And one of the big outcomes of this conference was that in England, there were about 30 people from England there. We couldn't agree. And this just shows that in red, the variation of answers between these 30 people. And they were all over the place. And the other countries were much nearer the center, which means that they all agree more. So all this led us to think, we've got to do some centralized planning in the UK and agree how we're going to treat these patients and treat them probably more aggressively than we have done in the past. So all this uh, eventually ended up in an application to the National Commissioning Group, who pay for bone tumor services, to fund a Ewing's <coughs> National Multidisciplinary Team. 
Um, and this funding was agreed. It took three years to come through, but it was agreed. It was announced in October, and the first meeting started in February of this year, and we've now had at least eight or nine of these meetings. And the aim of these meetings is that anyone who is treating a patient with Ewing sarcoma will phone in to one of these multidisciplinary conferences that are held online, they're virtual conferences, we don't meet at the same place, um, and we can discuss that case and agree nationally how we will treat that patient. And they're working very well. We had one yesterday afternoon at half past four, um, and there were 11 people in the conference, and we discussed four new patients with UX, and we, uh, we reached a lot of consensus. We're using something called WebEx. I don't know if any of you come across this. It is fantastic. It allows me, sitting in my office, or on the beach, or Craig Durand, one of your trustees, and Segi Abudi, one of my colleagues, sitting in a bar somewhere in the, somewhere in the world, to actually dial in. You can even do it on your iPhone. And you can actually dial into this conference and be part of it. And the correct thing is that you can see the x-rays of whoever is presenting the case. So you haven't got to send the x-rays to some central place. My x-rays from my unit can be broadcast to anyone participating in this conference. Um, so it, it, we can share the information and it seems to work very well. Um, so what we're aiming to do is catch all new patients with Ewing sarcoma, discuss every single one of them, reach a decision about how we think they should be treated, then check that it is carried out, and check again in a year or so's time that everything has gone according to plan. So um, it's working very well. Um, we're getting a lot of agreement. Uh, we're discussing some very thorny and difficult cases and coming up with some very interesting and novel ideas. And hopefully, this single step could improve our outcomes for you in Sarcoma by 10% um, over the next few years. So that's where we are. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me.